Today is the fourth day of the June-July 1985 seven-day retreat. And there are first two announcements. If anyone has a cold, it is better if the dishes are washed separately and kept separately. There is a, a sink for that and ways to do it. Please, if you do have a cold, get in touch with Chris, who is the kitchen coordinator. And then another thing about having chairs sitting on top of mats. In examining mats, there is a wearing where the four small legs of the chair press in on the mat. So we're requesting you to please not put a chair on the mat, but either fold the mat in front or to the side. Put the chair on the floor. Or if you wish to have your mat removed altogether to write a note to Chris or to Stu or Wayne, and they will take care of the mat. For the little benches and the balanced chairs, it's a little bit different because it's not those small areas that press on, but maybe we'll also find a way of putting some material underneath a bench so it doesn't have the abrasive quality. I don't know if we've already talked about it in this retreat, but it certainly has come up with many people in meetings. So we will go into this together in this talk and this whole matter of effort. what effort is and what effortlessness is. And whether one indeed has to make an effort as most of us think most of the time. Not just with regard to what we're doing here, but with regard to anything we tackle. We are so conditioned since we've been small to make an effort. And not just an effort that is required, an effort in required in lifting up a heavy piece of wood. The muscles have to work harder than in picking up a piece of paper but to make a visible effort, too. We have taken in from very early times the approving eyes of our superiors, parents, teachers, supervisors, bosses, when we've made a visible effort. then we were good, praiseworthy. In school, the, the demand, the, the prodding, to, you've got to put more effort into it, you've got to show that you're making an effort, or on the report card, she's not making enough effort enough of an effort. This is program, not just the mind, but the whole body. That conditioning sits probably in every fiber of our body. This compulsion, never questioned, 
compulsion, need, necessity to make an effort when we do something and to have it show too. Either to get reward and praise or to avoid blame. Typical scene of a classroom when the principal walks in, everybody looking a little bit more busy. <laughs> or at the workplace when the supervisor four person arrives to hammer a little bit faster or harder. And how pervasive this is can only be found out if one starts to question it altogether. One person told me it was amazing for me to find out for the first time how I grab a carrot when I'm about to peel it. And it is observable, one can watch it and can question whether all the muscles that are involved in the particular task are indeed necessary or the degree to which they are involved. One may find that very little effort is needed once one has mastered a task, once one knows the ins and outs of cutting a carrot or riding a bicycle in the beginning using all kinds of over over activity and yet once one knows how to ride a bicycle is all the effort gone or is there something left that one is not aware of a pushing because one has to push. It's, it's a way of life. One, one, hasn't, one doesn't question it. It's unconscious. It pervades our work and it pervades our leisure. One may hold a cup of tea in one's hand and and clutches it. And then one wonders why the whole body is tense or numb from overactivity. Together with this phenomenon that we've just talked about of making a visible effort so that one is either approved of by the people around one or not hassled for being lazy or lax. Apart from that, or in addition to that, one has also been indoctrinated and found out that through effort one can get places. If one does apply oneself, as it is called, to homework, do a, do a little bit more maybe as is required, one gets good grades. Parents may give a gift for a good report card. If one has a paper route in addition in the evening or in the morning, one gets money. The more papers one sells, the more money one gets. And if one works 
in a place, in an organization. Again, visible effort stands out, particularly if it's more visible than the effort of the next person when it's up for promotion. Which, make, which means effort to succeed in the business or in wherever one is working does not only involve doing work, getting a lot of work done, pleasing one's superiors, but also outdoing the others. That aspect comes in too, the effort to outdo others, to, be, to compare oneself and be compared favorably. <coughs> and there's, there's no question about the fact that this kind of effort in most cases succeeds. One does get ahead, one does advance to higher and higher positions. which in itself is a reward, but also wears one down. More and more responsibilities and the effort put into each one of them. The constant tension of the body-mind to fulfill in one's own eyes and in the eyes of others to keep the position because somebody else may be coming up through the ranks, may threaten the position, may outdo one, so that struggle has to continue. I don't know why different people start coming to a place like this or to a Zen center. Maybe many reasons, many different superficial reasons. One that is mentioned the most frequent is to attain enlightenment. One wouldn't come to a place in order to attain enlightenment if one hadn't heard about it or read about it. What one has usually read are enlightenment stories of people who have gone through the thing, gone through all kinds of efforts, and then attained this thing and a description of this which is most inspiring and enticing to also get, have, and the expectations that this will resolve one's problems, give one peace. And as it turns out, what is recommended to get this enlightenment is to do a great effort to apply oneself, to work hard, most of the time I think, I don't think it's unfair to say to work visibly hard, to get to this thing called enlightenment. Put oneself through all kinds of physical and mental hardship, pain, many and many spiritual paths. There is torture of some kind or other applied by oneself or others. Asceticism, denial of physical pleasures, all of this one monumental effort to get the final reward, this enlightenment. 
which one knows nothing about, one believes in it through what one has heard and read. Effort, if one looks at it oneself, as one observes making an effort in actuality, is always connected with resistance. What has to be broken through or worked against is resistance. If there was no resistance, there wouldn't have to be an effort made. We're not talking now about riding a bicycle, learning a skill. Learning a foreign language, actually learning a language to a child is not an effort. The effort is on the part of the parents to try to accelerate it. Teach him to read at an early age or something like that. A child picks up language effortlessly at home or wherever he or she grows up. It becomes an effort in school when all kinds of pressures and techniques are applied that cause a resistance. Also walking. It is, wa is learning to walk an effort for a child in the usual sense of the word. Or is it something that the child wants to do? That, that first pulling, pulling oneself up and standing up, there's a joy in that. One can see it. How pleased the child is. Or is it already pleased because everybody else around it is so fascinated with it? I don't think so. I think there's something in doing that that is not to please others. It's what the child wants to do, or crawl along, get from here to there, in whatever ways. Maybe the physical resistance is still the lack of coordination of the, of the muscles, but it's, it's no problem to the child. But in school, when we're told or on the job to make an effort, commit ourselves, there's usually a resistance, a residual resistance against all the effort that one was expected and pushed and compelled to do. And yet the reward is beckoning, so one has an incentive and one pushes against all that resists including people who seem to get in the, or do get in the way of one's progress, pushing them out of the way in one way or another. So can one test out for oneself, not take this over as a truth that is spoken, but find out for oneself whether effort always involves resistance. One says, I must make an effort. Or it's an effort for me to sit. Why? If there was no resistance to it, would it be an effort? One is so inculcated with the idea that to get anywhere one has to spend effort that one assumes it, one, one doesn't question it, and one takes it right into this work of looking into oneself.
feeling that somehow or other one must make an effort. Here where there are no particular rules imposed on how much one has to sit or that one has to sit at all. Where one can go for a walk if one feels like it or take a rest during a sitting period if one wants to. Maybe at first it feels real good as a relief, particularly if one comes from a training center which has been very rigid and strict in enforcing discipline. There's a feeling of relief. But then there comes this gnawing doubt. Shouldn't I work harder? People ask me. Or I have the feeling I'm not working hard enough. There's this vague discomfort of not working hard enough, of not making enough of an effort. It was mentioned by a lot of people when we did this retreat out in California, everybody had come from centers where discipline is enforced, Effort is stressed, pain as a medium to deeper sitting, to deeper states is stressed. The first reaction to a retreat in which none of this was stressed and no encouragement talks to this effect were given, first reaction by most people was a relief. A enjoyment of the freedom and an energy. But then again came these doubts. Am I doing all right? Am I doing something wrong by not imposing dis having discipline imposed upon me? Am I working hard enough? Asking someone else that. And this other thing which is so frequently mentioned and asked, all right, I'm doing all right with this, but wouldn't beginners need this? Great concern in people who have been doing this for a while and have been under discipline. If it is lifted, then the worry, what will happen to beginners if they don't have this discipline that I went through? and that I am still convinced I had to have, or else I wouldn't be here now. <clears throat> Does this vague feeling of not working hard enough, of needing to do more effort? Does this just come from one's whole past conditioning in which one was good and therefore safe and in anticipation of a reward when one applied oneself, when I made visible effort? Does it stem from that whole complex pattern, this whole complex program? which has not been erased in the mind, it's there, available at any time to be triggered. Why, why is one here? If one wants to get something, one hopes for an experience and one has read that to get that experience one has to apply effort, then one either applies it or feels guilty if one doesn't. 
and doubts whether one ever will get that experience if one doesn't. Is one here to get an experience? One has to really open that question up to oneself and look at it honestly. And what that experience is in one's mind. Is it an actuality, a real thing, or is it thought, projection, illusion? memory. Is one to strive for something like that? A set up goal? To be happening in the future? What is the future? Isn't that also a product of thinking? It is thought, isn't it? Future is thought, projected thought of what will happen or what may happen. Is one here to reinforce and redo all of one's old conditioning, this time not for a higher position in the company, but in the spiritual life, quote, unquote, whatever that means. <coughs> is it the same pattern one is going through that one has been through since one was a little child in kindergarten, trying to get this sticker? One time our son came home from kindergarten <coughs> And the sticker was, best rester. <laughs> it's the only sticker he ever got. <laughs> and I must say, I was very happy. <laughs> Felt proud of him. <laughs> We laugh, but aren't we all out for stickers of some sort or other? The visible effort and the visible reward. All the various costumes that religious traditions have devised for advancement. For the advanced in spiritual practice. may testify to this same thing over. So is one here to do the same thing over now in a new, in a new realm, new in quotation marks, in a different one, not in the worldly, but in the spiritual, whatever that means? Mm. Or is one beginning to question the whole thing, the whole, the whole thing of conditioning, which is our prison, the prison in which we live, the bondage. Not questioning it because somebody says, you have to question it, and if you question it, you'll get a reward. That has to be questioned. One, one's doing everything for a reward. Questioned and, and observed in operation as it happens, to see the whole 
effect on, on the body, mind, and on the other people around one of this system, of which one is a cog. If one doesn't question it, the machine or the computer goes off, printing out the same stuff over and over again. We've only talked about succeeding. The other side, of course, is failing, not succeeding, and then all the misery that comes with that. But even at the end of success, what is there? When one has gotten to the top of the company, top of the organization, worldly, spiritual, whatever, political. It's retirement. And then it's just memories of past fame. And the shallowness of one's life, will one then face it? Will the energies be there to face it? It's not a matter of how old one is to, f to start facing the prison, the bondage in which we live. <coughs> one can start at any, at any moment when it becomes quite clear that one creates it oneself. And wondering how, how does it work? What is going on? Why do I do this? I didn't even want to say it, and I've already said something. I said one thing, and I did another. What's going on? In the last retreat, there was a person who spent most of the time outside walking. He said he's, he's never in his life ever been in touch with nature. And this was almost overwhelming. This being in touch with the woods, the water, the, the weather, the rain, and, and, and sun, and the sky, the clouds, and all these grasses, and flowers, and the deer, and these birds. And he did come to meetings and wondered why we had a sitting room at all, why people were sitting in here. <laughs> a, a certain rebelliousness in that statement, a protesting what, what was going on and why people were doing this. 
but he is a very experimental and observant person. And later on told me, yeah, when you really need to look at something in yourself, you do stop. You, you don't walk through the forest and just take in all, everything. You have to stop and sit down and listen inwardly. He says, for myself, he tried to take the mat outside. He says, for myself, that didn't work. I'd rather sit inside. Some people sit outside. But the question of effort never came up because there was a need to find out not just about nature, but about oneself. Find out about thoughts, what thoughts are, what their effects are, what their limitations are, their power, what their power is. How they come up when there is this uneasy feeling of not making an effort, of not doing anything. Because it may be at such moments, this dis-ease, this uneasy, discomforting feeling of not making a visible or other effort, that thoughts come to the rescue. They fill the mind. So one is spared facing discomfort, uneasiness about being and doing nothing, nothing special, which we have never faced. No school, no home, no, no one teaches this or encourages this or even recognizes this as a vital thing to do to face one's inner being apart from our activities on the outside. To face one's inner feelings of insufficiency, inadequacy, emptiness, shallowness, loneliness, Really face it. And really facing means not making an effort away from it, trying to escape into some kind of a refuge in which one can show what one is. So let us ask here, is it an effort to look into oneself? Or does it need to be an effort? Is there effort involved? And have no conclusion at the start, yes, there is. I know that from experience, there is an effort. One has to distrust this authority of past experience. We may be very distrustful of outer authority and deny it or negate it, rebel against it, and go right along with the authority of our own past experience, which tells us you have to make an effort in this work. If one puts all of those assumptions, conclusions aside, and looks freshly, whether in observing, attending, whichever word one will use, in looking into oneself, listening to the words, the thoughts, the emotions, the muscular tensions, the knots, 
different parts of the body knotted up. The breath, heartbeat, intestines churning or gurgling. Does it need an effort? And if so, what is this effort? Is it that one is afraid to do it, doesn't want to do it, one is afraid of what may open up, the box top is lifted. Then of course there's resistance and if one says I must do this work then we will try to push through this resistance and there's effort. But resistance itself is worthy of looking at, of being with, of being sat with, or walked with, or lie down with, isn't it? If one will leave no stone unturned, not nothing ignored, because everything is the life of a human being, which means the life of humankind. Life. And maybe a new, a new energy will come into being, which is not the energy of willpower against resistance. but the energy which is there when there is the real urgency, the need to discover, to find out, which is in little children. For a little child, there's no effort to empty out the drawers ten times in a row. Mother puts it all back in and all out it comes again. Look in the drawers. Take everything out. Bang, bang. And usually at the end it's, it's yelled at for it or punished or put into another place. Don't do that. If one is still in one's old mode of thinking and hearing, listening, one will say, well, she says you must be aware, you have to be aware. And then comes the, the drive or the striving for that awareness. How can I get that? Or when it's there, for, for no reason, because awareness is not there for any reason. It's either there or it is not there. It has no cause. It has no cause. Of an insight comes, it has no cause. That's the beauty of it. So let's say there is and insight, awareness, everything is clear. No division, no one there to stand apart. What is, is, it's clear. And then the thought, how can I sustain that? <coughs> or I must sustain that. This is part and parcel of this work. I must become an aware person. And then we're right back in the same old program. I think this is very clear, isn't it? With that, awareness is immediately 
finished. And the program takes over. I must sustain it, keep it. And one may still have certain visible attitudes, visible signs of being aware, but it is like we talked about this person putting a jacket on. and not aware of anything around that one was blocking. Sometimes people say, well, how, how do I go about this? How do I become aware? Or how do I deal with this inundation of thoughts which takes place all the time? Which is asking again for a method, for a, a means to an end, a method to get that awareness or to stop the thoughts. Who, who is dealing with what? Who wants to deal with what? Is there a division between this me who, that wants a method to deal with the thoughts that wants to control them or deal with emotions, turn anger into benevolence, greed into generosity. It's all thought, isn't it? The division takes place in thought, not in reality. The me itself that wants to have a method is part of thinking, part of wanting. It is wanting. So who is it that is making the effort? Or wants to make the effort? It's all thinking, all ancient programs. Can there be insight into that? like when the clouds part and there is the sun. Glistening everywhere, on every leaf and blade and piece of earth.
you may say, looking at all this, something is still not quite right. When anger comes up, to really look at that anger. Really look at it. There's no escape into this thought process or that justification or I must overcome it. Really looking at it. That's arduous. Because all of our tendency is either to express it, get the release from it, or to justify it, rationalize it. Rationalize it. Find causes for it, immediate and remote. That's the programs are pushing, the momentum of the programs are pushing. But if one if one realizes one has been angry over and over and over again, and the pain of it, the aftermath, the hurt to oneself and others, and that becomes so, so real when one feels it, one has seen it time and time again, then what choice does one have but to look at this thing once, directly into the face? And then what is felt as arduous is energies not dissipating in one's habitual escapes, but gathering in looking listening, attending, whatever way you want to put it. Being there without any choice. Or the pain of, of losing someone. Someone said that their child left, lost the child. What will one do with this grief? What have we done in all times past but looked for comfort, consolation, refuge, anything but to have to feel that? Is it an effort to, to feel the grief or to see the anger when it's there, when it's right there? Or is, an effort, or is it an effort to distract oneself from it? Because we don't want to fiddle with words. Either there's the escape or there is just that. In the escape, the division continues. But in facing completely what is there with no unconditionally, with no strings attached, no expectations, nothing. That's the end of division. Isn't it? <laughs> 